Welcome to the Society, Society of Women Geographers webinar with Dr. Katherine Sullivan. I'm your host, Karen Kahanowicz, former chair of the SWG Washington, D.C. section. Okay, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Dr. Katherine Sullivan. Kathy was selected to be one of NASA's first six women astronauts in 1978. She was the first American woman to walk in space in 1984 and flew the highest altitude shuttle mission, which launched the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990. She served at NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, as Chief Scientist, Assistant Secretary for Environmental Operations, and from 2014 to 17 as the Administrator. This past June, she dove seven miles to the deepest part of the ocean, the Marianas Trench, in the private submersible called Limiting Factor. She recently authored and released a book, Handprints on Hubble, an astronaut's story of invention, which describes her NASA career in the history of the Hubble telescope. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much for doing this. Great to see you again, Karen. <laughs> so first, I have to ask you, you're now billed as the world's most vertical person. Can you explain <laughs> what does that mean? Who is your competition? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure there is too much competition. Um, that's evidence of uh, how, how irreverent my friends are. Uh, and it's an improvement from their first line uh, as both a scuba diver and two earlier um, deep submersible dives to six and 9,000 feet. Uh, one of the standard lines from my irreverent friends was, well, she's just a woman with extreme ups and downs. Uh, but I was working on a couple of children's books concept with a colleague here in town uh, who's you know, not scientific at all. And when he realized I'd both dived quite deep and been up in space, he first came up with, uh, and I think he was thinking of the, that good old Richard Rogers song. He said, well, that makes you the most vertical girl in the world. So that became the second running joke. Uh, and then as it turns out, uh, after the dive, uh, Victor Vescovo, who was the owner and pilot of the submersible, uh, connected me to Guinness, the Guinness World Record folks. And so they're now doing whatever massaging they do. Uh, and you know, there's clearly no woman that's been deeper than I have been uh, in the Challenger Deep and the height of the Hubble orbit that that makes me the most vertical person in the world uh, within, as they put it, within Earth's exosphere. So if you, if, you leave, if you leave the actual Earth environment and break out of Earth's gravity and go to the moon, you've obviously had a greater vertical extent, but, um, but that's kind of cheating, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the Apollo astronauts don't count. <laughs> Well, uh, um, Guinness, Guinness has found a, a parenthetic statement that lets that separate out. Yeah. And, and I didn't put them up to that. They came up with that themselves. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's exciting. That's a fun, that's a great story. Uh, for, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the Society of Women Geographers for a bit. Um, as you know, Women Geographers was founded in 1925 and women weren't allowed in the Explorers Club. And you were a member of both. In fact, um, you became one of the first female members uh, in the Explorer Club to 1981. So we wanted to find, how did you get involved in Society of Women Geographers? Yeah, it's, uh, I really like the story. Um, I, I was around about that time, late 80, somewhere in there, I, as it happened, I was reading uh, Anne Lava Steele's book and she tells uh, the title of which just escaped me. Um, but she, told the story of how SWG came about because the boys wouldn't let the women who often had been on the expeditions, but wouldn't let them in the clubhouse. And so several of those intrepid ladies said, well, the heck with that, here we go. You know, we'll meet and share the kinds of experiences and, and support that help us all be, continue to be explorers. And then not long after I came across that part of the book, the invitation came forward from the Explorers Club to the astronaut office and actually was for any and all of the first six women astronauts uh, to please come to their annual dinner uh, and give a talk. And, and any of them who wished, uh, the club hoped they would apply. Uh, and I quickly thought, well, that sounds like kind of fun. These guys, you know, Sir Edmund Hillary is only threatening to resign if any women get in. So that makes it even better. Uh, but it only seemed right that I should be a member of SWG before becoming a member of the Explorers Club. I didn't know, I didn't know at the time how many women were in the first cohort uh, or, or whether uh, we were sort of a unique invitation. Um, as it turns out, Sir Ed uh, did not resign, 
with women were voted in that that very week into that annual dinner. The other fun part of the story, though, is so I'm a PhD oceanographer at that point, and I've been at sea. I've done some genuine expeditions, but I haven't done anything really significant yet as an astronaut. But the Explorers Club is just sort of glibly saying, y'all come on and join us. When I called up and got in touch with, I forget who now, at SWG, uh, their response was not right away, well, of course. It was, well, I don't know, have you actually done something that meets our membership criteria? <laughs> this goes to prove this is an even more credible outfit than the Explorers Club. <laughs> Standing. So who was your sponsor? Oh, you, you, it's not fair to give me memory tests, uh, but Jackie Ronnie, I think, was one of them at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So obviously you feel that the Society of Women Ge Geographers does have value, even though women are now allowed in the Explorers Club. And I was wondering, in this day and age, what do you think are the most effective roles for SWG as an organization? Um, are there pitfalls we should avoid? Uh, you know, I, I think any organization has to continually look at the balance between uh, you holding holding on to long-standing values traditions practices criteria for membership and and seeing if they need to adapt or adjust as the world changes and moves on uh, I always come down this, this so SWG is one of three groups really that had some similar purpose to them that I'm in uh, and I always have felt that the primary purposes the purposes that I value are mutual support for other explorers and geographers, um, which, you know, the, the simplest form of which is the, the place to place to tell our stories and tell what we're talking about and get you know feedback, confirmation, suggestions, um, further insights uh, about what we plan to do or about what we, something we just did that you can get from other colleagues who have similar experiences, and then you know inspire and enable the next generation. So that you're you know, perpetuating the passion and perpetuating the field. Right, right. What type of value do you think the women only aspect of that of women geographers brings to the table? Uh, I think that that probably varies for different people um, and different personalities. Uh, I think there's there is a a greater ease of really sharing. Uh, sharing and exploring ideas, ideas you maybe don't have a firm grip on yet. There's, there's a greater level of ease doing that with very like-minded groups uh, with similar, you know, a shared culture and style. Um, you know, I've spent most of my career in, in mixed or all male groups. Uh, and you know, there's usually I think just the, the kind of competitive dynamic that is often uh, more common in all male groups. You know, I'm more reluctant to just crazy open up an idea because and maybe maybe the sort of barbs that come at you are meant to help constructively spur you uh, but you know it puts me off so I like having a, a place a group and, and a set of colleagues uh, that feel a little a little more co-creative uh, mm. and not so much co-competitive right right Oh, that, that's, that's interesting. Um, one of the things Women Geographers does, of course, is, is provide fellowships for young uh, scientists. And uh, as an organization, we're looking at being more useful to mid and late career female women scientists. Are there different types of approaches you might uh, recommend for each one of those kind of uh, age groups? Uh, yeah, so it's a great question. It's, uh, I hadn't really thought about it in terms of a strategy across that the whole age spectrum. Um, I, I you know I'd have to look into that some more, Karen, because I don't, can't really off the top of my head think about specifically what issues at mid or late career are you trying to help with. Uh, and I don't I don't know the granting world of geography as an academic discipline as well as I know the natural sciences. So it's a it's, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. You tell me. But what's SWG currently doing in those spaces? <laughs> That's, um, you know, as far as trying to get the uh, uh, people together in this type of an environment as well, now with the COVID, get people to share their stories. Um, you know, as, as a DC chair, we tried to get a good program going at least every month for everyone to come together at the headquarters and bring someone from the area or bring someone from out of the area to kind of just get together and have some fellowship and talk about what we've been doing. And um, as you say, be able to, to, to share um, openly. And, uh, yeah. 
similar type of, of uh, uh, issues and connections and things like that. So that's, that's mostly what we focused on. Uh, and now that uh, I think we don't want to say this is a mixed blessing, but one of our challenges was the, um, this type of uh, virtual uh, environment. And I think folks are getting better at that as we can see by yeah. 42 participants here. So it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's actually close to another question that I had for you as well, because you've seen the, I say issues of women and professional women in, in different professions change as you've um, gone through your career. You know, they were different in the 80s than they are now. Are there, I guess, lessons that you've learned um, through that experience? What, what kind of advice for success do you give younger women now? Well, I, I think there has been some change, but you know, human, human nature is human nature and a lot of the uh, um, imprints, patterns, stereotypes, habits uh, are, are planted really deeply in, in a lot of folks. So it's, I, I'm not a total Pollyanna about, you know, it's not all simple, smooth sailing uh, moving through life, you know, for, for anybody. Uh, and most of the it remains true that most of the organizations that structure and sanction and fund the kind of work that, that I've historically done and, and that SWG members do, um, you know, they're, they're set up at, at their best. They're set up believing that they're, they're just completely rational and merit, meritocratic, but you know, there's, there are headwinds for women, women trying to move in those organizations, either to move up in them in leadership or to uh, gain the, gain the stature needed to secure funding and support from the, the, the endorsers, if you will. Um, you know, it, it, you, you've got to have good stuff and be doing good work. That obviously is the first ingredient. Um, I, I think you just have to be eyes wide open that you're going to encounter a lot of different people that come at, come at the work, come at uh, the decisions surrounding the work in a variety of ways, some cooperatively, some always competitively. Uh, you know, there are people out there that see every bit of their professional life as sort of just, just a game. They have mm. very, very different value set and very different approach to it than, than I would have. But they're going to be there. You're not going to erase them from the world. And no, one's, no one can guarantee you a pathway where you never encounter one of those folks uh, and, and have to deal, deal with them, work with them, or figure out a way around them. Um, so grit, perseverance, um, Yes, some degree of a, a, a thick skin. I mean, it's, you know, you'll meet, you'll meet people that are just uh, men, and, men and women, by the way. It's not, it's not just men, but, you know, there's two, there's two ways they can outperform you and get that grant or get that expedition. And one is to actually outperform you and be better than you. And the other is to put you off your game. You know, mm -hmm. it's the whole objective of trash talk in sports, right? Get inside your head uh, so that you underperform a little bit. And that makes it easier for me to, uh, get the grant or win the job or whatever, whatever it might be. So, you know, you'll find those folks, uh, find, figure out your methods for, for stealing yourself and dealing with them and, and press on. Right. Right. And, and I guess that brings to mind too, the cultural differences. You know, I, I started my career as a Navy diver um, and the culture there was different from a Navy oceanographer, which was different yeah. from being at NOAA. And so you, uh, it started as one of the first six women astronauts. And so with the team of you there, there's a different culture. You've also been in the private sector and at NOAA. So I was wondering what, what type of, uh, what different approaches do you see in the different environments where you've worked? Well, I think it's it mainly comes down, it comes down a little bit to um, increasing bodies of research that, uh, have shown uh, diverse styles, diverse manners, uh, and cultures that are allowing, genuinely allowing of, and genuinely inclusive to varieties of viewpoints, uh, tend to perform better, both you know, creatively and economically, uh, than ones that are just you know, hard, hardball, either hardball autocrat or hardball, you know, elbows out hyper competition. Um, but a lot, you know, I've seen it as much as anything depend on the lead, the individual leaders. Uh, and again, I've seen quite a range of styles and a lot of overlap between 
uh, styles adopted by men and by women. I think there's a, it's a Venn diagram. I think there's kind of a preponderantly commonly male style that is more competitive. It is more um, sort of clinical, just do it. I told you so. Uh, and, and a more cooperative female style. It, but it, it's a Venn diagram. You'll see women that lead like this and you'll see men that lead that are better leading in the, uh, what I would call the, the authentic and cooperative mode. Some call that the, uh, some call that the servant leader model. I guess, yeah, the key lesson I learned uh, from all, all my different experiences, I would boil it down to there's some, there's some people who believe and, and some schools of thought that teach uh, that there's really only, only one real way to, uh, to reach excellence. And that you know, competition is the thing. So competitive pressure is always the best way to get the best out of people. Uh, it it is a way, and it can be an effective way to get the best out of an individual or or people. But you know, life has certainly taught me uh, it is not, in fact, the only way. Uh, and so I caution people to watch out that they don't become uh, the archetypal character who's only got a hammer in their toolkit and so considers every problem to be a nail. It's the only way I know to do something is just pound away at it. Um, I, I believe, uh, again, this is more an article of faith. I don't have research to back this up, but uh, I certainly believe that if your organization, the, the greater the diversity of your organization, gender-wise and ethnically uh, and age-wise, the more important it is that you not just wield that one hammer because you undoubtedly will have uh, different different perceptions and different realities in that group of people about who genuinely feels empowered who genuinely feels included uh, and just one one competitive tension framework is uh, will boost some but probably will put others off their game you'll be getting you won't be getting the best out of them mm -hmm. uh, so right. I think I believe lead, I think it's incumbent on leaders to have some dexterity in their methods, not just to say, well, I'm here now and I get to do it my way. And so now everyone else just has to adapt to how I do it as right. opposed to I can do some adapting to, to better mold the talent that we have around us. Right. Right. And what you mentioned earlier is the fact that, and I think, of course, I don't have the research, but the fact that the diversity of people actually makes your group do better. Um, yeah. It's, it, there's a there are a lot of a lot of well-founded studies out there. I know there there remain skeptics, uh, and there remain there remain those that say just you know it just requires more work from the leader. And mm -hmm. Now I'm the boss. I shouldn't have to do that. Right. But I'll tell you you know, I, let me share one story that was probably the best illustration, or the best proof point that I got uh, on this subject. And as a colleague of mine from Woods Hole, this is a number of year, many years ago now. He's a senior oceanographer. He was dean at the Woods Hole MIT Joint Oceanography Program at the time, um, probably at least a decade older than I. And he tells the story on himself. He's a, a big sort of bulky kind of teddy bear of a man, really a, a delightful, gentle soul. And he tells about you know, growing up in the field of oceanography uh, in the all-male environment. And starting when you're putting a cruise plan together, you get the different teams of scientists that are gonna be time sharing the ship for those two or three or four weeks. And the cruise planning process was, you know, mano a mano combat. It was, you know, there's only X hours per day that we can run the ship. And I, you know, I need, I need to have the say over where the ship will be. And I get these hours and, and your stuff, your science isn't any good and her instru his instruments are never any good. So just really fighting for, I should get priority. My work should get priority. Uh, you know, shouting, yelling, interrupting each other. And then they'd go off and have a beer when it was done. Uh, and the same would happen when they were out at sea, you know, every day, the day doesn't go quite as you plan. So every evening there's a review and a recap that adjusts the plan for the next day. And that again was the shouting match and the, the fighting and, and buying for every moment of the ship's time the next day. And John said, uh, he, he's not a fighting kind of person. He really didn't like the screaming and yelling. It was kind of painful to have to go through that. But, but he was really proud of the quality of science that was done on all those expeditions. And so, you know, that putting up with that pain and bother that he really disliked was a price willing, he was willing to pay for the excellence of science. But later on in his career, when he moved over to Woods Hole, 
he had some grad students going out on a cruise uh, and so they did all the planning ahead of time. He just went out to spend a couple of weeks at sea. And the, in that case, the chief scientist aboard was a woman and some number of the other scientists were, uh, were female as well. And he goes to the evening recap meeting and a couple of days in he realizes everyone, no one's yelling. Everyone's getting to complete their sentences. No one's trying to, you know, one up by insulting the scientific purpose or the, the equipment of some other member of the team. They're actually, and they're actually listening to each other and they're actually learning from each other and you're creatively helping each other and adjusting. And about a week into the cruise, he realized not only was he liking this a whole lot better, but he had never seen such outstanding science done at sea. But his takeaway message was really what was valuable to me because he said until he had that experience, if you had told him, John, take Kathy out to sea with you, but she really doesn't like to yell, so tone it down. What he would have felt was, you want me to settle for lesser science. Because he'd only ever seen hmm. the excellence he admired achieved in one way. So until he saw and experienced an utterly different pathway, achieved as, as good and better a result, asking that you stop the yelling and fighting would have meant settle for less. And, and he would have rebelled against that. Right, right. Well, that's a fabulous story. That's, it seems like that's the way to get the, get the message across is come up with more of those kind of stories so people can go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, well, pe you know, people change their minds because of something they experience, not because of something they hear. Right, right, even if you tell them five times. Right. <laughs> So, all right, thank you. Um, one other question about uh, with Society of Women Geographers. I mean, geography has been a big part of your life from the top of space to the bottom of the ocean. And the same with women geographers as we look at what is our message for people. How can you best describe the science of geography to, to young people, to funders, to national leaders? Oh, um, badly, probably. Uh, it's the, the the joy and value of discovering and understanding the world around you. Uh, and, I, and I tend to say it that compactly because everything can be unpacked from that. I mean, that can be, that can be the physical geography, that can be the nature of the landforms, that can be the microclimatology, that can be the, the, the social geography. It certainly could be, you know, the, uh, all the economic flows that make an economic geography. And, and of course, all of those things are very richly interconnected in lots of ways. And as, as we've learned in all of the earth sciences, I think starting in about the seventies, um, I mean, it, it, in the olden days, if you look back to sort of the 19th century, uh, my facetious way of explaining this is uh, you could pick a color and make a whole career out of it. You could pick brown for rocks and make a whole career just doing rocks or soil. You could pick light blue and make a whole career just doing the sky uh, or dark blue and make a whole career just doing the ocean. Uh, and in the 70s, I think somewhat catalyzed by uh, satellite Earth observations, uh, what became, I think, very, very clear is that the most important aspects to understand, if you're really trying to understand how, how the Earth works and how you know, the landscapes and societies and economies on the planet work. It's, you have to understand the fluxes and flows between those environments. Uh, it's both and, it, it's, you need to understand you know, good knowledge of the atmosphere, but also start to understand air-sea interaction. Uh, good understanding of forestry, for example, but also understand the fluxes, the land, the terrestrial ecosystem to atmosphere fluxes, because it's, it's those fluxes and those interconnections that are really essential to how it, how it works, why it works, uh, what aspects are most important to steward or to protect or, or to uh, rebalance. So that's why I come back to you know, discover the world around you and understand how it works. Because to me, that gets at both the what and the where and, and the how of the interconnections. And it, it leaves, I, I, you can do the laundry list afterwards of Right. Rocks, soil, chemistry, microclimate, so forth and so on. Right, right. That, I like that. It's like, you know, I'd use the, the word bumper sticker, but, but that's a very inspirational way. It's, it's how you learn how the world works. 
Yep. 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 Um, now I'd like to turn back to the, uh, we'll turn to the similarities and difference between space and the ocean. So many of the differences are obvious. Um, oceans are high pressure, typically murky visibility, but in space there's virtually no pressure and you can see literally forever. You look behind you. <laughs> um, but uh, in both places, we can't just go for a hike. We can't explore without having some kind of a submersible or a spaceship. So a few questions on that. First, um, physically, in what way were your physical experiences different in space and in the ocean? Yeah, the, from a person going along for the ride point of view, uh, the, the two key differences are the process of leaving the planet. Uh, that really amounts to riding a bomb. And so it's an intense, very intense, very high power, abrupt experience. I mean, you're embedded in an amazing, astounding ball of energy for eight and a half minutes where you shake, rattle and roll. Um, can you feel that in your body? You can feel the pressure? It's not pressure. It's vibration. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the air around you is still, uh, it's usually the same atmospheric pressure as you have outside, but the capsule you're in is doing this because okay. it's bolted to the top of a bomb. And <laughs> that's a bomb that has been carefully designed and trained so it will act like a rocket instead of just doing what bombs usually do and blowing everything to bits. Um, and then, of course, the second thing is uh, when you reach the destination environment because of your orbital velocity, you're effectively weightless. It, you know, we call it microgravity or zero gravity. Uh, and so your freedom of motion, your mobility inside the capsule is it's, it's like being a perfectly balanced scuba diver minus the resistance of water. You can you know, move anywhere with a fingertip. You can move huge masses barehanded. Um, so that, uh, those, those are the two distinct, most distinctive personal physical experience parts uh, other than the view. Uh, we go down in the submersible. Um, they're, they're long, long, slow, uh, almost sort of serene elevator rides. It's just a gentle vertical descent, you know, about a meter per second, which is about a mile and a half an hour kind of pace. So you, you could actually, the distance that we went to the bottom of the Challenger Deep is equivalent to about half the length of Manhattan Island in New York. And if you, if you go on Google Maps and have it calculate you a route from, um, from the ferry terminal metro stop up to the northeast corner of Central Park, that's about the same distance. And Google Maps would tell you, you should be able to walk that about twice as fast as we went down. So it's, you're sitting in, in, in this, this submersible, you're sitting in, in a seat. It's uh, not a bad approximation for an economy airline seat. So four hour elevator ride in, a, in the economy section with the seat belt sign always on. You can move around a little bit, you can shift your position a bit, but you know, you're not standing up and walking around anywhere. And it's, you, know, you you've no awareness, no physical sensation of the pressure uh, that's increasing with depth because the sphere that you're sitting in is resisting all of that and shielding you from it. Okay, does it get colder as you go down? Yes, it definitely gets cold because the pressure spheres for that depth are made of titanium. They're about a three and a half inch thick uh, wall thickness of a sphere. And, you know, that seawater temperature in the, in the great deep is if it's effectively, it's effectively freezing, uh, you know, 20 ish to below freezing, frankly, the it pressure, because of the pressure, it, it can't actually freeze. So we got down to about 22 degrees in the cabin. I mean, it's your bot two bodies worth of heat plus the electronics, but you know, modern day electronics actually don't throw off a lot of heat. So you're not going to win over all that water around you. So you're bringing a jacket down there. <laughs> yeah, this submersible does have a, a heater that you can flip on and off, but yeah. you know, it, that's drawing from your batteries. So ba battery power is bottom time. So if you, you, know, you want to stay on the bottom a long time, then you want to descend with mainly the outside lights off so they're not burning up battery. You don't want to use the heater, just better to bring gloves and a jacket. Save your battery power for the stuff that's important. Right, right. So what was the most exciting thing you saw on the bottom of the ocean? Um, well, the bottom. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, 
Yeah, I've seen plenty of geological and geophysical uh, diagrams and some remote, remotely operated vehicle uh, imagery from other deep trenches. I don't know that I'd ever seen much from the Marianas uh, Trench. Um, but it's just, you know, it is such an exotic little landscape. It's, uh, you know, if you, if you could, if you drained the upper 6,000 meters of water away from the ocean, because uh, we were in what, what's called the Hadal zone, which starts at 6,000 meters and goes down to you know, the Challenger Deep at basically 11,000 meters. Um, so if you drain the ocean, the upper 6,000 meters off and looked at a map of the world, it, everything that you think of as ocean would be brown. It would be the, the sediment covered and the rocks. And the only bits that would still be blue, that still had water in, would be these little slivers, these little curved slivers that mark the ocean trenches. Uh, so it's a small percentage of the area of the ocean, if you think of it that way, but it's actually a large percentage of the volume and it, the, the least well-known environment uh, on the planet in terms of really understanding the, the, the geology, well, the geology is reasonably known, but um, uh, the biology and, and the geochemistry, the deep, deep currents, uh, you know, how to, there is life down there. How does that happen? It's you know very food poor zone. So what are, what are the processes of bringing food uh, into that environment, and what role do these deep deep critters play in the overall oceanic ecosystem? So yeah. it just it's a, it, it was a very we were over the sediment covered uh, portion of the trench. We did not uh, as it happened we didn't get over to the edges where you see some outcropping rocks. So it was kind of like flying over a moonscape. We were, we were doing a topographic transect. So we were flying along about a, between one and two meters off the bottom. It's not great for a slow close-up view of the critters. We were kind of cruising past the critters. Uh, but I saw a couple of critter tracks, you know, along a long, fairly straight groove that sort of looked like you drug your finger lightly through the icing on the top of the cake. Um, lots of little sort of dimples on the surface that are undoubtedly, you know, bio holes, some little critters burrowed down to the sediment and is munching away on something. Uh, and some sea cucumbers, some holothurians, as they're called, um, you know, probably smallish ones, probably about this size that lie on the bottom and that the, the little bit of current down there and a little bit of our prop wash would sort of blow mm -hmm. them around a bit like tumbleweeds. All right. Outstanding. And that actually kind of leads to another one of the comparison questions is the, the scientific research that comes from ocean exploration and space exploration. And with your background in science and of course as a NOAA administrator looking at kind of both of those worlds, um, what can you say about, I guess, uh, pending discoveries that uh, we look for in space versus in the ocean and the, and the comparative value of those? Well, I'm obviously a biased person. I mean, I think the, uh... I think there's value to pushing the frontiers of knowledge and, and the technologies needed to do that in both directions. Uh, but this, you know, this, what, what space is, the greatest value of, of space uh, research for me uh, is the perspective it can give us on our planet because of the synoptic viewpoint uh, of our, of the whole planet that satellites can provide to us. I mean, it's, it is only since the space age and the advent of satellites that you can effectively uh, snapshot the whole planet. You can you could get a effectively instantaneous um, measurement of sea surface temperature on the whole globe. I mean, it's not actually taken in one shot. It's multiple orbits. It takes a, a day or two to accumulate, but that's that's fast relative to the circulation of the ocean. And so you're effectively getting a right now picture of the state of the atmosphere or right now picture of the, the state of the the ocean ocean surface temperature and that's that has been revolutionary to our understanding mm -hmm. of, of the earth um, there's still there is still so much to understand in particular about the ocean uh, that the uh, the re the resolution of seafloor topographic maps is about 10 times worse than the resolution we have on maps of the moon and Mars that's because you're relegated to using sound waves instead of lasers and things like that to make the measurements. And it's just, it's harder and it's fuzzier. But most importantly, there's so much we still don't know about life in the ocean. Uh, not long ago, uh, there was a campaign called the, the census, census of Marine Life, 
multiple teams of researchers all around the globe going off and just you know trying to more comprehensively get a grip on uh, all the life forms in the ocean. And there there's really wasn't anywhere they could turn that they weren't finding uh, tens to hundreds of new species, in particular at the you know bacterial and and, and uh, very small level of things, any little scoop of sediment. There's from who knew these guys were here over and over and over again. Right, right. So it's, it's yeah, that's I like the way you put that as far as the big view and then the tiny little things that you can also get, you know, yeah, for cancer, yeah. all that type of things. So it's a whole different scope, a whole different scale. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely bioprospecting potential, but um, from the, you know, my main thrust has always been through the earth system science and the knowledge base that allows us to have some predictive capability about what conditions are coming at us down the road, you know, for, starting with the trivial level of, is it going to rain this afternoon? You know, will the softball game be canceled out to when did you say that hurricane is arriving or out to uh, what's the sea level going to be around here in 10 years or 20 years? Is this mortgage going to be any good? Should I, should my insurance company write something uh, in coastal zone property? Those kinds of, uh, those kind of predictions, you know, in, in the, in the 19th century, uh, I, th I think it was Lord Kelvin, don't quote me on that, uh, said on the floor of the British Parliament uh, that given the rate of scientific advancement, he believed it would someday soon be possible to know the weather conditions expected in the city of London 24 hours in advance. And he was laughed out of the chamber. It was, imp it was idiotic. Right. It was impossible. We've now got seven and 10 day forecast that you can start to bank on. You can, you're can, you smart to sway your plans based on those. They won't always be perfect, but they're, they're actionable guidance. Well, we need, we need to push those time horizons out to where they're, we can have worthwhile outlooks at three, five, 10 years that were granular enough to be helpful to a farmer or to a civic planner or to a, someone looking to buy a home. Uh, today's climate outlooks are decade type scales and their granularity on the ground is tens of kilometers just because the computational problem is so big. Uh, so how do you, how do you push those together? How do you get the kind of, the kind of predictive foresight we know f in weather forecasts? How do you get more of that into this, let's say three to 10 year time frame? Because right now that's a big scientific gap. Right. Right. And all those things, obviously, you wrestled um, in all your positions at NOAA um, yep. and kind of along a little bit more of a bureaucratic bent. But I'm definitely interested after having worked at NOAA as well, is you've acknowledged NOAA's role as you know, the environmental intelligence agency and that it's crucial to the health of the planet. Um, but it's more difficult to sell than NASA. Um, how and to Congress actually for funding. So I wonder how, how, what type of things did you do when you were at NOAA and should the NOAA administrator do to address that challenge of, of how do you sell that, that important environmental mission? Yeah, one, one of the things that really helped NASA was that back at the time of its founding, uh, an, act of, an explicit act of Congress was passed that defined the agency, the need for it, the purposes of it, and sort of, you know, set the box uh, for there, there is a thing called NASA and it should do this. Uh, NOAA came together uh, almost 20 years later uh, in, in 1970 as more of an assemblage of, by the way, NASA came together as an assemblage of bits and pieces drugged from different places, but then it was given a unified shell and said, you are now all that. Uh, and so you kind of only need to sell the Congress on one thing, this thing called NASA. Uh, NOAA still remains to a degree an assemblage of its parts. And so you tend to get congressional interests more focused on just the bit that touches my constituents or touches my state. Um, I, you know, the purposes the agencies were set up for are completely different. I mean, NASA's, NASA's got a bragging rights mission, right? I mean, you know, do the next thing, break open the frontier, develop new technologies, make Americans proud and confident in their country. Uh, so it's, it's got the best shiny new toy um, remit of any any federal agency. Uh, NOAA's remit is, 
it, it touches more Americans every single day. It arguably touches every American every single day and predominantly in constructive ways that they value, like, you know, the weather forecast or the, uh, the nautical chart if you're a boater. Um, but it's, you know, each of those objectives sort of has to do a little more standing, standing on its own than is the case with NASA. Uh, the, the key thing I did, uh, and it did help us advance uh, our political support and our budgets, was another one of those encapsulations. So instead of coming in and saying, I want to talk to you about, no, we're this, we're this, we're this, we're this, we're this, we're this you know, go on forever. Uh, I said, we're, we're America's environmental intelligence agency. Everything we do, it, in everything we do is about understanding the earth well enough that we can generate information that's useful to a purpose. Everything NOAA does is, with the possible exception of operate the marine sanctuary programs, everything is about that. Uh, and then, then it became easier to point out all the ways in which that helped real human beings and it helped mayors, it helped citizens, it helped businesses. Uh, it's sort of a hidden utility that's, it's, it's like we never think about where all the electrons come when we flip the light switch. We just know the lights ought to go on. And a lot of people are benefiting and using the information NOAA uh, measured and calculated and processed without even realizing NOAA is the light switch you were counting on when you needed that. Right, right, right. I'm amazed to see that it's almost quarter till four. Uh, yeah, <laughs> time flies. <laughs> amazing. Um, there is one more question I did want to add, well, actually two more, uh, that I wanted to ask you before we turn to the, to the uh, online questions. One um, was actually suggested by one of our members. What sacrifice, you've had an incredible career. Um, what sacrifices do you think you might have made in order to become the most vertical lady? Um, has it been worth it? What, what trade-offs, I guess, have you had to make through your career? Um, I mean, all, sort of all of those boil down to what choices do you make in terms of where you invest your time and energy? Uh, and and I really do look back and think of them as investment investment choices rather than sacrifices. I mean, you know, as a very academically inclined kid, very eager learner, so age 12, 13, 14, the, the gaggle of gals in my neighborhood uh, spent a heck of a lot more time hanging out at the mall doing whatever they did than I did because uh, I found that utterly uninteresting. There were many more interesting things to do than go you know, hang around at a mall sipping sodas. So was that sacrificing the, that piece of fun of a teenage year? Uh, not to me, it wasn't. Um, I never married uh, for various reasons, but mainly uh, whether this is a, a limitation of my thinking or uh, poor, poor choices in men, uh, that it always seemed to me that would come too much at the expense of exploring my full potential. Um, so, you know, stay single again. Oh dear, you gave up, you gave up marriage and children. Well, you know, it's a bit of the luck of the draw whether you get a really great marriage and there are lots of ways, there are lots of ways to leave useful fingerprints on young children. I've had an extraordinary opportunity to, to influence and help more probably thousands of young children. Um, interestingly, Victor Vescovo, who uh, invited me along on his expedition to the Challenger Deep, uh, was, that was one of the things we chatted a bit about as we were going down and up and just kind of comparing life stories. Uh, and he's, he also has never married uh, for, and had very much the same reaction. I'd rather influence thousands than have one. Oh. Oh, interesting, interesting. That actually leads to, to my final question, was, is how would you like to be remembered? Uh, scientist, astronaut, explorer, educator. Awesome. And all around. That'll do. Yeah. <laughs> all around most vertical and awesome woman. And most vertical. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Thank you so much. And um, she had fun. <laughs> here we go. Um, what... I actually, I saw one of your, uh, your videos uh, from 1978, I believe it was, 79, when you were first. Oh, that's frightening. <laughs> as you sailing. Yes. <laughs> you sailing in Halifax. And so I was like, what, what do you do for fun? You're not uh, giving Oh, no, you know, I, I've always been an avid reader. I can get lost, easily get lost in books. Um, there's not a lot of sailing in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, 
small airplanes are also fun. I, I only just recently sold the, the little small airplane I had for 14 years because I, I just life had moved on and I wasn't flying it enough. Um, you know, easy, easy, simple things, hang out with friends, uh, take the dogs for a walk, just enjoy nature. I live in a lovely setting in Ohio and it's just really nice to hit the parks and go for walks and just you know, slow down and enjoy where I am a bit. Right. I guess this nowadays this gives you a little more chance to do that. Uh, it gives you a lot more chance to do that. I'm, I'm quite enjoying not living in airports as much as I have done over the years. Mm. Oh, I bet. I bet. Um, one of our questions uh, from Rhea is along the, those lines. Um, in this time of limited travel, what important work can SWG members do without being able to go out and do field work? Uh, well, I, you know, you could certainly think about ways to shift gears and, and do the influence work, you know, re reach out to uh, create events like this, but bring people, uh, younger folks, not SWG members in. Uh, take advantage of the fact that, you know, any member of SWG with all the spectacular and fascinating experiences that, that we've all had, uh, anyone can now share those with a very different uh set of audiences because it's it's this easy it's you know come to sit down at your table and turn on the computer and let's share some of the story so um and and you know that it might be that it's that uh that for now you turn the telescope the other way around and work on the influence side of things uh rather than the the going about and physically exploring um right Rhea follows, yeah. she follows up asking about that with the um, uh, artistic and scientific collaborations and wonders whether you have some advice for people who are actually working on those types of collaborations. Yeah, I, I think there's always a value to increasing the number of access points uh, that are available to people. So someone, you know, someone who doesn't see themselves as a scientist or you know, never liked geography in school, doesn't see themselves as very adventurous, uh, but comes into contact with uh, you know, some artistic expression inspired by or anchored in geography. And, and that opens a window into the field that uh, they, may, you know, they may manage to walk through. They, may, they see themselves in it more than they could have done before. Um, I mean, I, I certainly think we've probably all had that happen. They said, well, I didn't think I would like so-and-so, but then it came at me this way and I did like that and I did get it. And it, a little bit of a mental barrier goes down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And another question actually just popped up from Ellen. If you were starting out today, knowing what you know now, if you were starting out today as a young scientist, what would be your focus? Um, well, my focus would still be the earth. <laughs> the, I mean, the, the earth and how it works. is just that, that, that's it. That's definitely it. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I, pardon me. The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, would I end up in exactly the same subdiscipline? Uh, you know, that I don't know. I mean, one of the delights of my career is, is that both in both via NASA and my NOAA work, uh, my horizon was, I was able to get my horizon expanded from the deep sea geology and geophysics that I started with uh, to, to much broader scale of integrated earth system science. Um, there's a lot of a lot of fascinating pockets to go play around in in that kind of expansive realm. Outstanding. Um, do you consider from Joanna? Do you consider Jackie Ron to be a friend, mentor, or both? Could you briefly discuss your relationship, including what you admired about her? Well, I, you know, I I never did get to know Jackie all that well. I mean, she, when she sponsored me into uh, SWG, I was living in Houston. She was up in the D.C. area. Uh, we met a, a, a few more times when I came up to D.C. from 90, 1992 to 96 in my first stint at NOAA. Uh, but, you know, that was, that was, that was a pretty large, all-consuming job. So I was, I was not uh, a constant presence on the social circle and uh, a very unreliable uh, member of, uh, of any group in terms of showing up reliably at the meetings. Um, so, that, you know, I... I would say she was an acquaintance and someone I admired because of uh, her her history and her family history. Um, but we just didn't really have enough contact time, I think, to go beyond 
uh, beyond being acquaintances. Mm. Uh, mentor in the sense that I, you know, I, I learned something. I consider people I've only read about in books to be mentors. If I you know, study their lives, study uh, their experiences as explorers, for example, uh, there's stuff there that they're teaching me. There are things there I can either uh, learn, learn to emulate, try to emulate, think about how valuable it was that they had that characteristic. How can I work on developing you know, that muscle myself? Uh, and you know, mistakes or errors that you try to lodge in the back of your brain and say, let's, let's not make that one. Um, so yeah, just, just Jackie's story was a, a form of mentorship to me. Right. Right. And that is such a loaded word. The mentorship it has so many different levels and change. It's, be, it's become yeah. such a sort of, you know, mm. almost, it, it must be a thing. I, I will ask you if you will be my mentor as opposed to, you know, anyone you get to associate with, anyone you get to work with, uh, you know, watch them. They're, mm. they're, they are, uh, they, they are mentoring. I mean, it's, mm. I, you know, probably my astronaut experience, but uh, gives me a little more of a perspective on this. But again, everyone on this call, I'm sure has had these experiences where you had a very brief encounter with someone and a short exchange that you really can't even remember happened. And you learn years later that for them, that moment was very influential. So, you know, mentorship can be that long, mm -hmm. both in terms of what you're, when you're the giver and when you're receiving, but to be the receiver of that, you've got to have the mindset that there's lessons all around me. And it's, it's on me to watch and observe and think about them. And if need be, circle back around and say, Karen, Karen, can I talk to you about this? I saw you were doing, fair, fair. But, you know, Karen, will you be my mentor? Sort of sounds like once a week for an hour, it's, it's called therapist, right? It was, it's just different. <laughs> right, right, right. Outstanding. Oh, we had one other question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Do you think the Explorers Club provides a good space for female geographers and field scientists now? Um, you know, I've, I've not had to uh, rely on the club for uh, resource or support. Uh, I, I think they're, I think they're continuing to try. Uh, the, the board and governance structure is a, a better mix of, uh, certainly on the gender side, uh, the, the club continues to fall short. It's, it's not very diverse uh, ethnically, uh, but it's, it's getting slowly a bit better uh, on the governance side. And the recent awards and fellowships are beginning to yeah, and flag expeditions for that matter. So they're, they're progressing. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's cultural dynamic is still got large elements of, of boys club to it, but there, for, there are several of us that are nudging, shoving, kicking, pushing uh, to move it in the right direction, move oh. it in a better direction. Right, right, outstanding, outstanding. So are there any questions that I didn't ask you that you wanted me to ask you? No, I think you, you covered a lot of great ground. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, we have a couple minutes left. Um, I just had one question in my back pocket that you covered in your book. Uh, you talked about um, being in charge of the wake-up calls for the shuttle astronauts. <laughs> I was wondering if you could just relay that story quickly for everyone. Yeah, so uh, the job title I had was Capcom, you know, capsule communicator. And uh, in the shuttle era, like Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, that was the only person in the mission control center that actually spoke to the crew was another astronaut who had that Capcom job. Uh, uh, and the, the idea is you understand what they're going through and how they're thinking about things, and you can be the best connector and translator. Uh, and obviously, Capcoms work in shifts to cover all around the clock, and one of those shifts coincides with when the crew is all asleep. And so the big duty on that shift is take stock of what happened yesterday, update tomorrow's plans, send all the new plans up, and that's the technical part of the job. Uh, and the style part of the job is pick the music that you're going to play when it's time for the crew to wake up. And the custom is that there's a, there's a clock counting down the time remaining in their sleep period. No one talks to them until it goes to zero. And the custom was you just start some music. So it's sort of like your clock radio waking you up with a song instead of with a blare. 
you start some music, you let the song play through. And when it's done, you say, uh, good morning, Discovery, Houston with you standing by or something like that that says, hey, no hurry, we're here. Uh, and I, I was, I had that job for the first flight after the Challenger accident, which was feeling very momentous to all of us and uh, pr felt particularly momentous to me. And I, so I started thinking about what are you going to play to wake the crew up on the first day that they're in orbit when we haven't had an American crew in orbit for two and a half years. And I just, you know, some random rock and roll song just seemed like the wrong thing. It, it, it there's got to be a song that sort of speaks to the meaning of the day was, was my mindset. Um, so I went on the tear trying to figure that out. And then I started, I, I wasn't having any luck landing on a song I liked. So I thought, well, well, step back. How are you going to feel? How are you going to feel that morning? And I, the closest thing I could think of is I'm, what I'm going to want to do that morning is yell good morning like Robin Williams did in Good Morning Vietnam. And that set a light bulb because I happened to know someone who had some Hollywood connections. And so that friend got me through to Robin Williams agent. And I sent out a little crib sheet of it's, you know, space shuttle discovery and here are the names of the crew. And it turns out Robin Williams was a contemporary of one of the crew members in college out in the Pomona colleges. So I then got back um, tape recordings. I insisted on having the original tapes. Uh, they, I think they threw Robin in the sound booth. They said, Robin, space shuttle, blah, 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 go. And he ripped off like 15 variations of Good Morning Discovery, uh, 12 of which would have gotten me fired if I played them because they were just a bit raunchy or rowdy. Uh, but one was, you know, a couple of them were really good. And then I ha happened to latch on to a guy uh, who, who was working as a volunteer tour guide at the Johnson Space Center whose day job was writing uh, j uh, comic, you know, satirical lyrics, joke lyrics, and, and advertising jingles for a radio station. And he took Beatles and Beach Boys melodies and wrote exquisitely perfect space lyrics to those melodies. And then he had this little pickup band that he got together with and they recorded them in the, uh, at the radio studio after hours. So after Robin screamed and yelled, the song I led off with was uh, the melody was the um, the melody was the theme song for that silly old TV show called Green Acres. <laughs> Green Acres is the place to be. Da, da, da. But it was all you know. Earth orbit is the place to be. Freewheeling and discovery. I mean, they're just <laughs> spot on, brilliant lyrics. <laughs> and the best part was I told nobody in the mission control center what we were going to do not even the guy who's the boss of the mission control center so uh my other two astronaut colleagues who were uh, understudies for me they knew but no one else knew so the whole room is busy they're working they're getting ready to hand over to the next shift everyone's just all very technical and suddenly robin williams voice goes screaming through mission control center and you can actually find if, you can actually find a video online that shows that moment. It's the view into mission control when this gets played. And if you watch, uh, you'll see me in the center of that scene. And you can tell I'm really happy with this joke. And I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody's reaction. I'm, I'm barely managing to contain myself. But everyone else, you see all these faces go, what? You know? <laughs> and then sort of sit back and start laughing. It was, it was a great moment. Oh, that's fabulous. So it's all, not all just a grind. <laughs> Now you gotta gotta make your fun when you can. Fabulous. Well, thank you so very much for showing up. Um, thank you to Mary Van Bet Blaugui uh, for setting all this up. Thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. It's been great fun. Thanks everybody for joining. All right.